Good morning, everyone. I'm really grateful to have you with us again today. This is part 12 of our discussion, uh, examining whether it makes logical sense to believe in a creator or not. Uh, now, as our in-house schedule resumes today, this is September the 6th, if you're uh, watching this at the time of broadcast, uh, we have our in-person classes going, uh, but we still had these last two sessions, I would uh, presume, of this series, and we wanted to finish up, and so these will be online. Uh, if you're watching online and you're seeing this, then obviously you found it, and everything will uh, just be uh, as normal. You can watch it uh, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings or any time thereafter. So we should have this week and next week to, to, to finish up, and I think those will be pretty packed with a lot of uh, concluding material and bringing everything together. I'm so grateful that you've been part of this discussion and for the comments that you've given me. I hope it's been profitable uh, and there may be parts of it that you may want to go back and look at. And by the way, uh, we've said this before, but I just want to say when we wrap up the last session, we will do a specially edited uh, notes version of slides and make those files online uh, 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 that you can download either PDF or JPEG format. We'll work on that, but we'll make sure you have that. And if there's material that you need, you can go back and watch or listen to anything, of course. Uh, and if there's material that you need and don't have, please get in touch with us here. We'll make sure that you have what you need. Uh, we want this to, to be of some use to you now and perhaps in the future as well. Well, as we pick up, we've been, of course, looking at this idea. Uh, does it make sense to believe in a superior entity, a creator, intelligent design, God? Uh, we, we've not necessarily said that it has to be the God of the Bible, but just is there a creator who designed does it make logical sense to believe that in light of science, evidence, et cetera? And we've split that into four questions because there are really four major phenomena that need to be explained either because of the action of a superior entity or without one. The existence of the universe and everything in it, the precise structure and organization of the universe, the initial appearance of some kind of life on this planet Earth, and finally, the diversity, complexity, and precision and function of life that we see now. So we're on that last question, uh, and here we're comparing some uh, different hypotheses. The uh, prevailing neo-Darwinian uh, uh, evolution hypothesis, macroevolution we might call it, and then we'll mention some of these others, of course, uh, a variation on that, or some hybrid of evolution initiated by God, but then continuing by itself, or, finally, the idea that a god, a superior entity, created life in the form that pretty much that we see it uh, and instead of letting it evolve that way. So those are some of the competing hypotheses we're looking at on this fourth major question. So last week we zeroed in uh, on the evidence for this, and uh, here's the, the way really I set that, that up, just to, to give you the, the, before we zoom down into the trees to kind of tell you where we are. Evolution cannot be directly tested or directly observed, and therefore it doesn't really meet the definition of science. Uh, but we can examine other evidence to potentially falsify it or to bolster our belief that it could be true. Okay, uh, And so I don't know what could be more fair than actually scrutinizing the evidence for or against this theory of evolution. You don't see that happen very often at all. In fact, most people uh, will not want you to start looking at the evidence for evolution. It's just, hey, it could happen, and therefore it did happen. Uh, but we looked at those assumptions and found that they're not quite valid, and since we can scrutinize the evidence, well, don't you think that's what we should do? I can't think of, of a better way to evaluate than that. And so, uh, based on, on the analysis of what we find with the evidence, and we're going to pick back up with here tonight, here are the questions that we're trying to answer about the evolutionary theory. Does it have credibility? And that is, does the evidence support it and, and bolster the, the idea that it is credible and that we should accept it as true? Does it make more sense and have greater explanatory power for what we see than the competing hypotheses do? So that's kind of where we're headed with our examination of the evidence. So our overall consideration of evolution, we looked at the unique premises and the treatment of this theory. Uh, it gets treated and handled very, very differently from most other uh, theories that fall either in the realm of science or science-related. Quite different, actually. Uh, 
uh, the, we looked at the foundational assumptions that are usually used to promote uh, evolution without really any uh, examination of evidence. The highlighted choice you see here, we are in this critical analysis of the evidence, and then we'll uh, proceed on from there. So we started into the evidence uh, in a very detailed way last week in session 11. If you did not see that, you'll want to do that because a lot of tonight won't make an awful lot of sense if you haven't seen the preceding sessions and especially part 11. But first of all, uh, the affirmatively supporting hypothesis-specific evidence, that is, things that definitely support evolution, not just consistent with it, but definitely support it, and would not be consistent with intelligent design by a superior entity instead. So you see what I mean there. Are there things that really show us, yes, it was evolution and not something else? And there's not any. Now, if you're just seeing this and you didn't see last week, you may say, well, where in the world does that guy get off making a statement like that? Of course, there's a lot of it. Well, please take a look at part 11. We went through that in some detail. All right, the fact is that all of the evidence that's typically claimed as illustrating evolution, that is things like uncanny adaptation of organisms to their environment, et cetera, amazing complexity of life, Amazing precision, amazing features and functions in animals and even plants for that matter as well. But all of those things are at least as compatible with design by a superior entity as they would be with evolution. Uh, and a lot of things, it could be either one. It doesn't really tell us which one is, is the more likely to be true, etc. cetera. Uh, but there, there isn't any evidence that uniquely supports macroevolution that wouldn't support creation at least as well. And so, uh, as I said, we will talk about why so-called microevolution does not correlate with macroevolution. Uh, and so we'll get into some of that this, uh, this morning or this evening. Okay, uh, so next is the missing evidence. We looked at that in some detail last week. And what we mean by that is this, things that we need to see as evidence if the evolutionary theory is correct but they're conspicuously absent instead. You see, after 160 years of Darwin's theory of gradualism, uh, and then it's been refined into kind of neo-Darwinism, same theory, just with some genetic knowledge added in for the supposed mechanism of it, 160 years of very vigorous work, great advancements in genetic knowledge, another 160 years to dig for fossils all over the world, etc. Well, by now, we should have a wealth of supporting fossil evidence just like Mr. Darwin said we would have if his theory was true. We should have numerous clear examples of random mutations producing survival advantageous new anatomic features and functions. We should have all kind, we should have examples running out our ears by now. But as we reviewed last week, we have none of the above. None of it. It's all missing. Uh, and it actually gets worse from there. And we're now told, though, uh, that, oh, no, the fossil record, it, it, it's not missing. It, it, oh, it fully supports the evolutionary theory. So you might wonder, well, it, Mr. Darwin frankly acknowledged it did not support the theory. He said that's one of the, the most serious objections you should have to my theory. And his idea was, you know, we don't have the evidence yet because we just haven't had long enough to dig yet, but we'll find it. And he strongly suggested if we don't find it, you should probably reject my theory as being false because it has to be there if my theory is true. Well, he was right about that, and we haven't found it. 160 years later, we haven't found it, not at all. But what people have started doing finally is just uh, saying, okay, let's, uh, let's quit looking for that. Let's, uh, could we move on and not make an issue out of that anymore because it's all missing and it has to exist or this theory is false. So a growing number of people are now saying, well, it doesn't really matter whether we find, we know this theory to be fact, so it doesn't really even matter if we ever find the supporting evidence or not. I can't think of anything more unscientific than an approach like that. Uh, that is not uh, intellectually curious or vigorous uh, or even intellectually honest. That won't work, okay? So the lack of evidence in the fossil record, it's not only a glaring discrepancy at this point, but a fatal flaw for the theory. I mean, the theory's dead right there. As Mr. Darwin noted, if the, quoting him, interminable varieties connecting together 
all the extinct and existing forms of life by the finest graduated steps. If those things, as predicted for the theory, are not found, the theory is effectively falsified, and that is exactly the case. But, as we said, that's not the only problem. We're also missing any demonstrations of those sequences of mutations giving rise to advantageous new features and functions, and we looked at that in some detail last week. So, where we came to then is, will we take Mr. Darwin's advice and, as he said, rightly reject his entire theory? Well, I mentioned to you the observation that Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, an atheist and evolutionist, had made about the lack of evidence to support Mr. Darwin's theory and the, uh, the usual version of macroevolution, that is neo-Darwinism or gradualism. So tonight we pick that back up to say, let's see what Dr. Gould then did with this fatal flaw in the prevailing version of the evolutionary theory as we move into the contradictory evidence. Okay, well, uh, I uh, remind you, and I'll show you a part of his quote again in a minute, this that you're looking at uh, is called usually a phylogenetic tree, phylum as in, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, you remember that. Okay, a phylogenetic tree. This is uh, the best recreation currently among evolutionary thought of how life arose to the, the diversity and complexity that we see on the planet in 2020. You see at the bottom, it, inorganic matter, we talked about this uh, theoretical mechanism of abiogenesis, that is life arising from non-living material. So that's where this tree starts with non-living uh, organic, chemical, uh, or, well, in, inorganic even, uh, actually, initially, just chemicals with no life, then organizing themselves, we talked about that a few sessions back, into RNA and DNA, and finally they became a living organism. And then that living organism reproduced, and then it started getting better and more complex. So you see branching off to the right there, uh, at some point, plants and animals divide. Um, we'll have to talk more about that, I think. That's not such a simple uh, conclusion. Uh, then you see the, some of the uh, uh, simpler forms of life, and then you start seeing them uh, divide. And over on the right-hand side, you've got worms and then some of the uh, uh, sea we might call them seafood, but sea creatures, etc., uh, insects, spiders, all those kind of things. Over on the left side, then, you start getting some of these uh, other animals, cartilaginous fish, and then fish with bones, and then reptiles, and then birds, mammals, and different types of mammals, etc., uh, up until finally you get the primates there at the very top of the tree, and eventually humans. So this is the, the so-called tree of life or phylogenetic tree. You'll see this or, or some version of this in all kinds of textbooks, et cetera. It's like, hey, this is the way life got to where it is today, right? Well, <clears throat> here's what Dr. Gould pointed out, and I'll give you just a part of one of his quotes that we looked at in detail last week. He says, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So what he's telling you is, let me back up one slide. You see all that nice tree? Man, it just looks, wow, that, well, that really makes sense, doesn't it? He goes, yeah, but the only problem is it's all missing. We, we don't have any of this branching and these transitional forms. That's all somebody's idea of how it might have happened. What he's saying, the only information that we actually have from that tree is this, which is to say, none of it, none of the transitional forms. And I, I do urge you, again, if you did not see part 11, you've got to see that. Uh, there are many people in moments of honesty, which some of them have even said later on, boy, I wish I hadn't said that, I wish I hadn't said that out loud, uh, have admitted there are no transitional forms. It's all missing. So when you look at this, uh, well, there's a little bit of difference in that tree, isn't it? Uh, namely, none of it's connected uh, because we don't have any such thing. It's all conjecture. 
uh, it's all theoretical. It's all, you might even say, wishful thinking because there is no evidence uh, that could directly point out what should go in the middle there. And that's what Dr. Gould is saying. He goes, we don't have any of that. He goes, it, all the rest is inference, and it might be very reasonable, could be right. I don't know, but it's not from evidence. Well, the consistently observed pattern, you see, and this is what uh, Dr. Gould recognized, it's not of finely graduated forms like Mr. Darwin predicted there would have to be, and indeed that is what there would have to be if his theory were actually true. But what you actually see instead in the fossil record is the very abrupt, sudden appearance of every variety of life in its final form, not in some halfway form, some transitional form. No, what you see is that, uh, and let's talk especially about animal life, but you could say the same for plant. <clears throat> you see that these organisms appear very suddenly in the fossil record, and they are fully formed. They're like us, okay? They're like the current form of these fish or these primates, etc. Uh, and then they don't change. There's stasis, unchanging. They don't change until they're extinct, if we see them go extinct, with no significant changes. So they appear all of a sudden, fully formed, without any apparent ancestors, and then after they appear, they don't change until they disappear. Okay? He called that punctuated equilibrium. All right? It's as good a name as any, I think. Equilibrium, of course, kind of means a steady state where things don't really change anymore. So that's stasis, that's staying the same. Punctuated, that is, periodically interrupted by massive, sudden, in fact, immediate changes uh, that seem to happen all at once, not with any uh, noticeable transition, etc. Okay, so he called this punctuated e equilibrium. Dr. Gould and Dr. Niles Eldridge put forth this uh, uh, alternative form or, or hypothesis within evolution in 1972. Now, again, I'm not trying to misrepresent anything. They were atheists. They were evolutionists. They're just pointing out the gradualism, the widely prevailing theory of evolution just doesn't work. It does not in any way fit the data that we are able to see and examine. So a phylogenetic tree as proposed by Dr. Gould would be this one. Instead of everything starting from a common ancestor and then it branches a little here and then that branches some more and, and then you know all of these things are happening, he said, no, it doesn't happen that way. You have all of these major groups, and they're, they're not labeled here, but I think you can get the idea. You have all these major groups that just suddenly appear. Okay, and, and uh, it's not a gradual branching process. They just all seem to, to show up at the same time out of nowhere. In fact, if you look at geology, they come at a time that is often called the Cambrian Explosion, a particular period uh, of history, Earth history, where all kinds of species just suddenly, they're never seen before in the deeper layers of sedimentary uh, material. And here, all of a sudden, here they all are, all at once, all fully formed. So that's what he's depicting uh, in this uh, alternative punctuated equilibrium phylogenetic tree. So this actually fits the data much better than the other does, but there's still one small problem. You see here that uh, Dr. Uh, Gould is saying at the bottom of the chart there, they all still, they came from one ancestor. We just don't know how uh, immediately it just transformed into everything all at, uh, kind of all at once. Well, here's uh, the final true reality. There's no transition at all. In fact, you might notice this one looks like when, uh, a minute ago I showed you what the phylogenetic tree really looks like that everything in the middle is missing. Well, see, when you come down to it, Dr. Gould's uh, tree of what we really have to observe doesn't look any different than that one. Everything's missing. Now, his was uh, uh, the one that uh, a second ago, the one he proposed, well, that's a whole lot closer to reality, except it still kind of implies this common ancestry, which we do not know to be the case. There is no such evidence in the fossil record. So here's the reality, once again, we can't find any evidence to connect these various groups of organisms. They all just appear seemingly out of nowhere, all at once, fully formed, and then they don't 
gradually change into anything else. They stay exactly the same until and, and if they disappear. All right? There's no observed pattern of any transitional connection between anything at all. That, that's just the truth of it. The, instead, uh, as I've mentioned, what the fossil record actually shows is the sudden appearance of an amazing variety of fully formed, very complex organisms, no real changes until mass extinction in what appears to be some kind of an aqueous, a water-based event that led to mass extinction of so many of these species. And then, following that, there's a sudden, this Cambrian explosion of all kinds of fully formed species that look like our current variety of life. So, Dr. Gould's hypothesis is to say, okay, Darwinism doesn't explain what we actually see. It's incompatible. Here's what we see. He said, so punctuated equilibrium is what we have here. Unfortunately, though, he didn't tell us how punctuated equilibrium was supposed to have taken place. So there's no mechanism that he offers for the random generation of these observed findings. Um, so Gould's observations, albeit without any proposed mechanism, fit the data perfectly, whereas the gradualism theory of neo-Darwinism is fully contradictory to the data and the reality. However, Gould's clearly accurate findings and analysis are often criticized. Most evolutionists reject Gould's work. Here's why. You'll never hear them state a reason for it, but here's why. Because what he described, the, the sudden appearance of an amazing variety of fully formed, <clears throat> very complex organisms, no real changes until mass extinction in an apparently aqueous event, and then a sudden Cambrian explosion of fully formed new species that look very much like our current variety of life. Well, that would be, and you may have already kind of uh, put this together, that scenario that he describes in the fossil record would be amazingly consistent with creation by a superior entity, mass extinction in some event, kind of like a worldwide flood, and then a sudden reappearance of all kinds of fully formed species, and then no real change in them since, unless some of them die out. Well, we can't have anything like that, can we? Oh, goodness, no, that sounds too much, that's, that's too close to, to, uh, to a hypothesis that, uh, that we, we, we're just absolutely refusing to consider. So we sure can't have anything like what Dr. Gould, and Dr. Gould did not believe in creation, as I mentioned to you, but it's just that what he described, it just sounded, that sounds way too compatible uh, with, uh, you know, with a creation type account. So most people will, will just kind of politely ignore Gould's very accurate observations. So the fossil evidence that must exist for the widely held theory of macroevolution by gradualism, the neo-Darwinian theory, the fossil evidence that absolutely has to exist for that theory to be true is completely missing. And further, what we do find in the fossils and in present life fully contradicts that gradualism, neo-Darwinism theory, but fits perfectly with a creation hypothesis instead. So, yet another fatal flaw in the evolutionary theory. But that wasn't the first one, that's just the, the next one. But there are more. The same phylogenetic trees that, that I showed you that are based purely on conjecture and they constantly revise them, and now I don't have a problem with, with that uh, because if there were truth to them, you're, you're constantly trying to revise your, your fine-tune your hypothesis with new evidence. That, that would be proper if the underlying premise actually were valid. But even after constant revision, they're still based purely on conjecture. 
Now, we don't have time to go into this, I, I, and I'm just so sorry that we can't delve so much deeper into every single bit of the evidence that I'm presenting to you. I'm really giving you the briefest overview, but I hope enough to let you know what the real score is and so that you can go and dig some more uh, and read more and more on all sides. You should, pro, con, everything about each of these things. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, but I will tell you this, those same phylogenetic trees, they still, even after all this revision, contain multiple skips and discrepancies which cannot occur if the neo-Darwinian theory is correct. What I mean by that is this. In one of these trees, they'll say, oh, okay, so you know, the, the reptiles then had this function, uh, and then, uh, well, that disappeared in the next uh, species, but then it reappeared again down here. No. If the theory is correct, you can't have that. Things can't appear suddenly. And in fact, things shouldn't disappear if they had a function, etc. So uh, I do apologize that I, I don't go into more detail on that right now, but uh, they actually feel pretty good if they get it down to a, a small number of outright contradictions. I, I once heard a preacher say, though, that, you know, a fatal flaw is a fatal flaw. A contradiction is a contradiction. And, and I once heard a preacher make this analogy. He, he said, saying that something only has just a couple of unexplainable contradictions, well, that's kind of like telling your wife that you've been, you know, 95% faithful to her. Well, that's not quite good enough, is it? Uh, or, or maybe, uh, you know, the old expression of being a little bit pregnant? No, I don't think so. Uh, it has to be right or it's not right. And there are absolutely contradictory discrepancies in these phylogenetic trees. Uh, an extreme example of this, I'll just mention one. Well, I'll let you read about it a little bit. An ancient creature, uh, long extinct, called the trilobite. And we have numerous perfectly preserved fossil examples of trilobites uh, so that, that the entire organism could be studied very beautifully. Okay, in the ancient sedimentary strata, early, early uh, animal, you might say. And it had, not gradually, but the immediate appearance, fully formed, very complex. In fact, the most complex eyes and optical system that have yet been discovered in any organism in nature. Now, that should have uh, taken billions of years to evolve, right? And yet, here's this trilobite among all uh, more primitive animals, etc., with this extremely advanced optical system just like that, okay? No similar features found in any other organisms before or after that. No precursors to it, no transitional forms, a complete contradiction of Darwin's theory. And if you really want to upset uh, somebody advocating a phylogenetic tree structure, ask where the octopus family fits in. Uh, you're not going to be very popular with that person after you ask that, that question, uh, as well as some of these others. Uh, you'll, you'll be marked off as probably having a creationist tantrum real quick if you even dare to ask the question. Uh, but the idea that the octopus might have actually arrived from outer space instead of evolving here, it's actually making a comeback, believe it or not, because it doesn't fit anywhere. It completely defies the whole evolutionary scheme. But that's just one example. These are just additional fatal flaws for the evolutionary theory. By the way, how many deaths does it take to be dead? Just one but we've already got three or four major fatal flaws already for the evolutionary theory, things that completely negate it or effectively falsify it. All right, but in fairness, and as I have promised you in the last couple of weeks, we have to consider evidence that shows variation in animals, even in short periods of time. I mean that we can actually see, maybe even in 20 or 30 years, we can see this. Mr. Darwin, uh, in his day, he described what he saw, but he couldn't look 160 years into the future. He had a short period of time in one human life, a few decades, to look at these things. Uh, so I can, to, a, to an extent, I can kind of give Mr. Darwin a pass. Uh, he at least did say, look, eventually these things have to be seen or my theory's not correct. 
but he probably knew that in his own lifetime he had no chance of actually seeing them. Um, but in short periods of time, you actually can see changes happening, sometimes really quickly, in a population of organisms. We'll, we'll talk about animal uh, organisms especially. Um, so usually, what is described, as we mentioned, for example, the, 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 the species or, or animals that gave him the impetus uh, to formulate his theory to start with were the finches, these little birds on the Galapagos Islands. Okay? And uh, they have a certain size and shape, a morphology, that is, of their beaks. Some of them have, you know, large kind of hooked uh, beaks, and they're really good at, at eating little insects. There are others of them that have maybe a longer, thinner, kind of more needle-like beak, you might say, and they're really good at being able to pick some seeds out of a corner of something and eat those, etc. You get the idea. And you can actually see them change over time very quickly. When there's a drought on, on Galapagos Islands, as occurred in 2004 and 5, uh, it wasn't long after that, a lot of those birds died off because their food source just disappeared, and so did they. Uh, and very quickly then, you saw uh, a preponderance or a, a predomination of other uh, varieties of the finches that were really well suited to get at the food that was still there and still could be had. Okay, kind of makes sense, really. Well, the idea then is if you can see, and some people call it microevolution, uh, not really a great term because it's a different thing, but nevertheless, uh, you can call it variation by natural selection, microevolution, whatever, adaptation. Uh, but the idea is this is supposed to be proof of the validity of the, the uh, gradual genetic uh, change mutation mechanisms of the whole macroevolution theory. So it's supposed to actually prove, yeah, the theory does work. Yeah, it's highly improbable. Yeah, mathematically it shouldn't be able to happen. But hey, here, we see it happen right in front of our eyes. And if for whatever reason it seems to happen so quickly, well, then it's not much of a stretch of the imagination at all to think if you gave that a several million years and a few billion years, you could get huge changes and new species and, and increasing complexity until finally you even get human beings, etc. And of course, uh, this is a, just a complete side note. It, it always seems funny that we consider ourselves to be the top of the evolutionary chain. Uh, <laughs> we may not be, well... Uh, we, we may not always be as smart as a, as a species as we think we are. Uh, I guess the wisdom question would be, uh, can we acknowledge that and realize, uh, you know, we may not be the, the ultimate either. Okay, but never mind, that, that was a digression. All right, so this is supposed to be the basis uh, then to say, well, by extrapolation, if we can see this significant change in just a few years or 20 years, well, then, given enough time, we could see all of the change that represents all life on planet Earth by extrapolation. Okay, so let's look at this. That brings us then to what I'm going to call the shifting evidence. And you'll see why I say that. Um, and there are some things there that I didn't talk about before, and I promised that we certainly would come back to them. Okay, if we can observe definite and significant variation in organisms in short periods of time, well, logically, doesn't that suggest that uh, even the beneficial mutations, that they are, we've said, extremely unlikely, we've kind of shown that, uh, but wouldn't that really suggest that these supposedly unlikely beneficial mutations, hey, for whatever reason, they are somehow occurring, not rarely, but pretty frequently, and they are producing new useful features at a surprising pace that you wouldn't have thought they, they could do, okay? And is an extrapolation of that phenomenon entirely reasonable? Well, those last two, those, those questions then, you know, doesn't, the, the, the variation that we can see, doesn't that say that these mutations really are occurring in producing new features? And doesn't that mean that extrapolation of that to, to the long-term big picture is entirely reasonable? I would say it would have been logically reasonable to answer those two questions with yes and quite possibly so, until we understood what actually causes these observed short-term changes. 
Mr. Darwin didn't know what was causing them. He just saw a lot of variation going on, and he drew an inference from that. Was it the best inference? Maybe or maybe not, but it was probably reasonable for his day, I would say, and for the short observation that he had. But now that we've had plenty of time to study this, and now that we have this remarkable ability, even though it's still limited, but really good, to actually start looking and sequencing genomes, we can learn so much more about what's really going on, okay? So for some of the information that I'm going to share with you next, uh, we can thank some really diligent researchers, uh, many of them, probably most of them, in fact, dedicated evolutionists uh, who have gone in to try to explain, okay, how is this evolution happening? And I'm so grateful that they have because they have uh, really uncovered quite a bit about this, about what's actually going on, or in this case, not going on at the genetic level. So, let's take some representative examples, okay? We need to look at these, and it, it would be most unfair of me if I did not give serious consideration to these, uh, because these things are usually put forth as, hey, here's your beneficial mutations right here. Here are your, your useful new features that you're looking for right here. Here's that, you know, what I call the missing evidence, et cetera. Uh, well, most evolutionists would say it's not missing. You're looking at it right here. There's, there's a short list right there. So it would be most unfair if I didn't uh, seriously consider these. How about a few things like uh, bacteria that can develop resistance to a particular antibiotic? We all know about this phenomenon. Uh, it, it seems to be in some cases that, you know, when you used to get uh, a sinus infection with uh, Haemophilus influenza or whatever, uh, actually I'd have to go back and review my microbiology a bit, uh, et cetera, but you, you get an infection with that bacteria, penicillin should work great. But then at one point, penicillin didn't work so great anymore, and it's like, oh, okay, well, amoxicillin, that, that seems to work very, very well and still does most of the time. Um, but then there can be some of these that they get resistant to that. Um, and finally, we get to some things that some people call superbugs. They seem to be resistant to all kinds of antibiotics. Uh, and, you know, you want to you wanna save some of your most powerful antibiotics for the rare case if you really need them because you don't want more resistance developing and then spreading. Okay, so you're familiar with the, the phenomenon of, of bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics. Very, very similar thing is uh, different insects ultimately becoming partially uh, or, or reasonably uh, resistant to certain pesticides so that those don't really work very well anymore. Now, in, in some cases, you'll find, you wait 30 years, they'll work all over again. Uh, but at any rate, it's a very similar phenomenon. Or how about in the human body, this is very similar to those two, the fact that your immune system, not just humans, but other animals too, uh, most animals to some degree, especially the mammals, have very highly developed immune systems. <clears throat> when you get confronted with a new bacteria or a new virus that your body has not seen before, your immune system immediately goes to work trying to figure out, trying to formulate uh, or build, devise, an antibody that can specifically match that pathogen so that your immune system then can, can uh, turn out a, a ton of that antibody and wipe it out. You're familiar with, with this. Uh, so there are certain areas in your body that they are, I'll say, designed. Uh, they have the function uh, of trapping a virus or a bacteria so that it can be studied and so that these uh, plasma cells and B lymphocytes can come in and start working on trying to, to uh, devise a, an effective antibody for that. And in some cases, if you can figure that out, that can lead to a vaccine as well. All right, another example that most of us have probably heard of is uh, something called a peppered moth, a tree moth, et cetera, that come in white or, or dark varieties. Uh, and depending, when, when uh, in England, in the Industrial Revolution, air pollution started changing the bark color of some of the trees, and all of a sudden, the white or, or very light-colored moths, uh, they were able, the birds were able to spot them a mile away and, and eat them because they stood out, uh, you know, uh, like a, a sharp contrast on the trees. 
Well, it didn't take long till the very dark colored moths began to predominate because they blended in a lot better with the, the new color of the trees. Okay, evolution in action, possibly we'll see. There are other color changing animals. Um, some that you know are able to, to change their color, kind of like that, to blend in with their environment. Uh, and some of them can, can do it uh, very quickly. In fact, there are some that can even do it from second to second as they uh, move along the seafloor. There are certain uh, types of squids and, and octopi, I guess that's the word, uh, et cetera, that as they move along, they just dynamically, their body color changes. You know about animals like chameleons and, and, and certain ones that can do that, okay? Amazing adaptation uh, that you see there. And uh, again, we'll talk about this classic example, the changing size and shape of finch beaks uh, in relation to uh, conditions and food supply, okay? Now, we have to give fair, serious consideration to these because all of these are uh, proposed as and could be examples of rapid evolutionary change. And if they are, then I'd have to say, as I said a moment ago, if these are evolutionary change by the Darwinian method, well, then you'd have to say, wow, uh, you know, the math and the biology wouldn't have predicted that to be possible, but here it is. So I guess it, it, it really is believable that you give it a few billion years or something, you could get a human out of that if you get that much change that quickly. So let's look at those. So first, let's understand natural selection is a well-proven phenomenon. It's real. It exists. It works. It happens, okay? No doubt about that. So natural selection is this idea. If there's a bird that likes to eat moths and the, the, these birds come in and the white moths stand out like bullseye targets uh, and the, the dark colored moths tend to blend in and they're hard to see, well, it's not hard to figure out that the white moths are gonna disappear down the old hatch uh, pretty quickly. And the next generation of insects, it's not going to have many white ones in it because they all got eaten before they could reproduce. So the dark colored ones, the, they were in this situation the fittest for, for the, the prevailing conditions, so they'll reproduce. And one generation later, poor birds are in trouble because now almost all the moths are dark colored and they're really hard to see, etc. Okay, that's natural selection. But natural selection selects from the existing genetic material as opposed to creating anything new. Notice this. When all of a sudden it was a disadvantage to be a white-colored moth and it was a survival advantage to be a dark or black-colored moth, that didn't suddenly give rise to black-colored moths. They already existed. It's just that now they were the ones that survived to reproduce. I think you get the, the, the picture. So it didn't create a new variety of moth. It just selected one of the existing ones. So on my slide, as you see there, there was a Dutch botanist, Hugo de Vries, uh, said in 1905, natural selection can explain the survival of the fittest, but it can't explain the arrival of the fittest. The animal, the, the, these different uh, uh, traits had to be there to select from. Uh, they didn't appear all of a sudden out of nowhere. Now, that is their phenotype. There is your genotype and phenotype for any given trait. You may be carrying a gene, for, uh, one tall gene and one short gene. So that's your genotype. Well, your phenotype is how tall you are or what color your skin is, either ridiculously white like mine or maybe better quality skin like some of you may have, okay? Uh, but we all may be carrying several different genes. You've had the phenomenon, I'm sure, of looking at some photographs of your uh, ancestors many, many generations of back, back, maybe uh, when photographs were kind of new, exactly. Uh, 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 and you look at those and you, you, you may come to a picture in there and you just think, oh my goodness, I'm looking in a mirror. That's my great, great grandfather, et cetera, who died 50 years before I was born. And that looks exactly like my high school pictures, it, you know, just change the, the shirt and tie and change the haircut or whatever, that could be me. Or you see somebody <clears throat> whose baby pictures look exactly like, you know, great uncle somebody. 
so these phenotypes, that's what you look like. That's what gets expressed. You may be carrying more than one gene for something, but the phenotype is the one that actually manifests itself in you. It's what color your eyes are, uh, regardless of what genes you might be carrying. It's what color your hair is, uh, despite all the variation that you may be carrying and passing on to more generations. Your phenotype is, is actually what manifests itself in you. So if phenotypic, for example, being a white moth or a black moth, that would be your phenotype, okay? So if phenotypic variation exists, then natural selection may cause some traits to predominate and others to diminish in the population, at least for the present time. So let's look at three of those things then, bacterial antibiotic resistance, pesticide resistance in insects, antibody production in humans, etc. What we now know is these are not random mutations. They occur, they are changes that occur in certain areas of the genetic material, the genome, that are called hypervariability regions. They are constantly changing, not just now and then by mistake. It's almost as if they're supposed to change constantly. Maybe by design, that would be a possibility. It looks that way. But nevertheless, these are hypervariable regions. Imagine this. Have you ever seen a movie or TV show or something where uh, criminals want to break into uh, a safe or a vault, and it has a complex electronic combination lock on it, and you could never guess that it'd take you your whole lifetime to, to, to stumble across the right combination. So, of course, they just pull some little device out of their, their toolkit there, out of their, their black bag, and they just put it on there, and you see the numbers. And, and in a matter of seconds, it tries every possible uh, combination of the millions until it hits the one that opens the safe or the vault. That's what these regions do. When you encounter a, a virus or a bacteria, there are regions in some of your cells that that's what they do. They immediately start trying every combination they can possibly think of. When they find one that works, it's as if they say, okay, guys, I, I've hit the one here. Let's start making copies of this antibody. That's what bacteria do uh, with the, these same things. The, the, they're different in, in humans, but the idea is the same. These hypervariable regions constantly producing new combinations, just constantly. And then when uh, one works, then natural selection will make that one predominate. And by the way, sometimes bacteria will then share them with other bacteria through something called a plasmid. They'll share the wealth of, of this new uh, useful thing that they found. Unfortunately, when there is a change like this, uh, it often results in impaired growth of the bacteria. Now that's okay. It's better to survive and not grow quite as fast than to just be wiped out. Uh, but there are prices to be paid for it. It's not entirely beneficial. And sometimes there's loss of other function as well. But in all of these cases, here's the thing to note. There's no accumulating change. Tomorrow, they'll just change to something else, but it doesn't instill a new function or a new feature other than just staying alive, not getting killed. It doesn't add anything to the organism, and the change does not accumulate. The next generation will have to do the same thing all over again for itself. No accumulating change, and for evolution, there has to be accumulating change. Things have to keep getting better and more complicated, um, higher function, etc. You, you know, you don't go from a, a bacteria to a human without a, a, a whole lot of accumulated change, and here in this phenomena, there is none. How about the other ones then, like the color of the peppered moths, some of the color-changing animals. Let's say not the ones that can change from second to second, but the, the ones where each generation uh, can, can blend in with you know, the, the vegetation that it lives on, et cetera, and the changing size and shape of these finch beaks. And, and I have to say, in a lot of this, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot more information than we had time to cover once you get the, uh, the study notes section of this when we're done. But uh, there was a, a whole book called The Beak of the Finch in 1994 by Jonathan Weiner when he went back and looked at everything that Darwin wouldn't have had time in his lifetime to look at. And then some research in 2016 and 2017 
where they said, okay, we're now able to actually sequence genomes. Let's look at the, the finch and see, can we find the genes that control the size and shape of the beak? And sure enough, they did. Fascinating work. And here's what they found. Now, they still say, wow, isn't evolution great? But if, never mind the conclusion of their paper, read their data. What they found very clearly is it's not genetic mutation. It's something called epigenetics. That is more than or overarching <clears throat> genetics. Epigenetics means that some of the genes you carry can either get turned on or turned off. Now, some of them are for a lifetime. I've had this same color of eyes my entire life but some of them can get turned on and off during your lifetime or with a couple of generations after you. So what Jonathan Weiner found when he looked at, at the uh, changing si size and shape of, of the, the beaks of these finches, yeah, over a few years they changed quite a bit, but over 160 years, they didn't change at all. He said they just wobble about a phenotypic mean. Mean, of course, uh, signifies an average, Phenotype, we said that's the shape and the size of your beak. So he said, yeah, they get bigger, they get smaller, but then next generation they'll get bigger again and they'll get longer and they'll get fatter. But overall, they don't change. The average stays the same uh, and it just cycles around. They just wobble around an average with no actual genetic change. You know why? Because every one of those finches, and this is what they now found, Every one of those finches were already carrying a full library of different beak-shaped genes. They just expressed one or the other of them as their phenotype. There was no mutation. There was no evolution. It's just that in this generation, this beak worked better, so that's what they grew. But they were carrying all the others in their bag of tricks the whole time, and they always have been. In fact, that could be consistent with design of the highest level. But again, the idea is this. Same with the peppered moths. They actually carry the genetics to be either of those colors. There's no accumulating change. There's no new function. In all of these examples, and that was just such a whirlwind, look at a couple of them at a cursory level. But in all of those, you see there's no accumulating change, which you have to have for evolution. There's no new function or anatomic feature, which you have to have for evolution. This fully contradicts the Darwinian, the neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. And, and furthermore, the discovery of, of epigenetics as the actual mechanism in many of these with no eventual change at all, that means that these changes cannot be extrapolated. You cannot say, well, we saw this much change in 20 years, then we could surely go from bacteria to human, you know, in a couple of billion years. No. What that says is they're completely different mechanisms. There is no correlation between the two. You can't uh, extrapolate any of these to something bigger over time. So the entire supposed underpinning of why we're supposed to be evolution just got crushed yet again. I've called these examples, you can probably now see shifting evidence, because you see the very things that were supposed to exemplify evolution in action and predict its large-scale occurrence actually turns out to be a completely different, unrelated phenomenon, which contradicts macroevolution and predicts not the occurrence but the absence of long-term change quite consistent with the fossil record, actually. We don't see long-term change, much less any accumulating change or new species. The whole theory falls flat once again, thanks to some beautiful work by evolutionary researchers. When you look at their data, it actually destroys the theory that they set out to prove. Well, we will come finally to the rational convincing mechanisms that we should see in evolution. And then after that, we'll look at theistic evolution, the consensus, and start looking uh, at trying to attack the superior entity hypothesis as well, and then wrap it up. So we'll leave it there for this week. I hope this is useful to you. I'm sorry for the rapid pace that we're moving at.
uh, but I know some of you actually love that, and I hope that it will give you food for thought. So I look forward to seeing you again online next week, and until then, I hope you have a great week ahead. Thank you.